So we have uh, joining us uh, for this panel uh, State Senator Donnie Trotter from the Illinois 17th District, uh, Assistant Majority Leader and uh, Leader and uh, an important lever as well, uh, but an assistant majority leader and chairperson of the Appropriations Two um, Committee and vice chairperson of Appropriations One. So well versed in the Illinois appropriations process from the Senate perspective. And uh, State Representative Robin Gable from Illinois' 18th District, uh, who's vice chairperson of the Appropriations for Human Services and chairperson of the state's human, of the House uh, Human Services Committee. And uh, Jerry Sturmer, uh, adjunct instructor now at the School of Education and Social Policy, colleague of mine now at Northwestern University, and uh, former director of the Governor's Office of Management and Budget, and uh, former comptroller for the state of Illinois. So uh, this is a, uh, a part of our stellar panel uh, team. Robin, just in time, very good, welcome. Uh, and uh, I like that. Um, and uh, they will uh, enlighten us about this uh, uh, spending side, what are Illinois' uh, funding obligations, how budgets are constructed uh, from both the executive branch perspective as well as the legislative branch. Uh, and I think we're gonna start with Jerry, is that right? Yes. And there's a handout that's uh, being distributed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Health and Medicine for pulling this conversation together. Um, I welcome the opportunity to uh, reflect on uh, the current state of affairs. I'll try to be brief, but I, I and I'm happy that that you'll be getting the sheets, and I, I'll begin begin with a few thoughts before we go to the sheet. Um, clearly. Uh, we've seen a gigantic U-turn in the state of Illinois finances uh, during the um, uh, time between 2010 and 2015, uh, the backlog of, of unpaid bills uh, after the, the struggle of the Great Recession began to be whittled down, uh, you having a tax rate of, of, of uh, a higher amount than had been before enabled the state to struggle with the assignment of paying a, a much higher uh, annual contribution to the uh, backlog of bills in the state public sector pension program. That's not been mentioned. I'm going to emphasize that a little bit more this morning because it's a very significant part of the state's fiscal crisis. We've taken a gigantic U-turn in the last 12 months where we were whittling down the backlog of bills and the unpaid challenges. We've now seen that go dramatically uh, the wrong direction. Point two that I want to share this morning is that the media has focused us on the lack of appropriation. Oh my God, we don't have a budget. And we really have a hybrid situation where many of the line items are funded even though there's not a complete appropriation. That's not the central issue. The central issue is we don't have a revenue stream that's strong enough to match our obligation stream. And, and, and I can't emphasize this enough. I woke up in the middle of the night saying, oh my God, that's the central issue. We have told ourselves, oh, it's the lack of this appropriation. Most things are being funded. Those that are not appropriated and not being funded are a horror, an unbelievable tragedy. But the real issue is we don't have a revenue stream that matches our commitments and obligations. Third point, and I think we're leading ourselves to this this morning, especially having um, the two initial panels, the public has no clear sense of this set of obligations that we have embraced historically through 
uh, our history of, hey, we want to do education, we want to do health care, we want to do human services, we want to do public safety. We've forgotten those many, many policy debates that have happened over the last decades. And now we're hearing, oh, well, we really can't handle all these things, so we're certainly going to have cutbacks. How many times have you heard the formula is, well, we need new revenues, we're going to have to have some cutbacks, and then we'll get back to business. Not a single person in this state has identified the specifics of what they're willing to cut back, including our, our friends and, and, and John McCarran's former colleagues at the Tribune Editorial Board. They have not made the case for a single reduction. The only reductions that we've seen t uh, people seem comfortable with are things like, well, we could have a smaller office space. We could have a few less state cars. Let's sell a few airplanes. No one is getting up to the podium and saying, here's why we should spend less money on education. Here's why we should invest less in human service. No one's making that case. In fact, when the, the actual budget that was presented last February included some of those things, we've now seen the administration back off. Well, we didn't really mean to cut child care. We really like child care after harming child care. So we don't know from anybody specifically, including the Illinois Policy Institute, what reductions should be made. My sense, and I think all of yours, is that there's a lot of commitments, a lot of obligations that we collectively through our body politic have embraced, including the health care ones that many people in this room care passionately about, that if we asked one by one, are we interested in home health services? Are we willing to sacrifice some of our paycheck through our taxes to do those programs, the answer would be one by one, yes. Are we willing, and you know, I could go down a long list. Most Illinoisans could not articulate that list, but if engaged in a discussion, they would support that list. I think, and I suspect, Michael, that at the end of the day, we ought to talk about how to engage the body politic in that discussion. The lack of clarity about what we really do through our state obligations, meaning the state laws that have structured our commitments to education, social services, health care, et cetera, uh, because we don't have that clarity, uh, we gravitate to the narrative of, oh, there's no budget, it's terrible. No, the issue is there's not sufficient revenues to meet our obligations, and we like our obligations. Or if someone has a particular obligation we don't like, come up to the table and explain it to us. I often tell this story, and, and uh, it's a painful one, it's an important one. When uh, Governor Quinn asked me to convene uh, leaders of the four legislative caucuses, in the summer of 2009, remember we were in a huge, huge financial meltdown in our country, and the question was, are there a billion dollars of the state budget that we collectively, Republicans and Democrats, could agree on and take before the General Assembly and whittle it down? Uh, let's, let's develop that list, and so week after week, in the budget office of the state government, the Republicans and Democrats convened. I was at the table, and every time we thought about an issue that maybe we could trim back, somebody said, my guys won't go for that. And those observations were made equally by the Republicans and the Democrats. Do you want to cut X? Well, my guys won't go for that. 
Uh, and and m m my takeaway was the Republicans were as energetic about, uh, uh, we're not going to do that, as were the Democrats. Why? Because there is a clear understanding that home health care is important. There's a clear understanding that if, if we're going to close a penitentiary, certain legislators are going to have a lot of pushback. If we're not going to fix roads, there are going to be some problems. And maybe they will come from the people in their automobiles, but maybe they'll come from the road builders. Lest I ramble with those stories, I want to call your attention to what was published uh, 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 about a week ago by the governor's office of management and budget. This is called the three-year projection. This is something that is required by law, a law that Pat Quinn signed. And uh, a, it's, it's presented in a shape and form, a design uh, that my office put together several years ago in compliance with the state statute. At the end of December each year, this was a few days late, this year on, on January 6th, the GOMB is required to present a look ahead to the next three years. What we see here, look obviously at the bottom line, at the end of uh, fiscal 2019, the state will owe $25 billion. Interesting that like uh, most salespeople, we, we go 24.9. It's 25. <laughs> That's a horrific number. It just shows that we were on the track of paying off our bills at the end of fiscal 15. We had some, a number that had been $10 billion, unpaid bills, backlog of bills it's called. We were down to $4 billion, and we were on our way towards getting that to a 30-day cycle. Uh, the, the tax rate went down, and so at the end of the current fiscal year estimated, we will owe 4.6 additional dollars. And I congratulate uh, my successor, Tim Newding, in putting out a fairly honest presentation showing us that uh, revenues will be lower in future years than they would have been at the, at the previous tax rate, showing us that you can't expect that riverboat gambling will salvage us, or the lottery will salvage us, or federal sources will salvage us, um, that uh, even with a modest rate of growth in sales taxes, William told us that our sales tax system is pretty antiquated, uh, we're not going to grow in sales taxes very much. Um, and we're going to have to spend at current law, these amounts, and what will they leave us? Look at the six items of expenditures, six, seven, eight. They actually added a ninth that we didn't have uh, before. They call it below the line adjustments. We just called it salvage, meaning you don't actually spend every dime that you appropriate every particular year. Um, but in education with minuscule growth, Minuscule. In a state where it's appalling that we leave the, the poorest districts hanging out to dry. We need to fix education. Public safety grows. Human services declines. In a state where we know that the rates that we pay are among the lowest in the country. Uh, Marge Berglund can tell you that in the DCFS arena, we pay extremely low rates and we struggle to maintain consistent services for our abused and neglected children. Many of you in the room know that in all aspects of healthcare, 
we struggle to be uh, at par with our, our fellow providers in other states. And we're not seeing that healthcare line grow up uh, in the way that it needs to to provide the care that we, we're, we're talking about. Some of the growth here, by the way, is going to be that the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, which is now paying uh, federal reimbursement at 100% of our cost, will go down slightly. So the growth in health care is partially reflecting that the state will have to pay closer to 95% in the out years as, as opposed to the 0% that we pay today. It's not reflecting a projected increase in rates. So if we stay at the tax rate that we're at now, we cannot match the vision that Amber and William presented to us in the first panel. And we will not be able to look ourselves in the eye when we get up each morning with a $25 billion shortfall. I believe that this can be helpful, and maybe we want to put together some sort of seminar to really tease this out, because you know I've shown this to many people, and everybody goes, goes away saying, well, Jerry, that's nice. I'm glad you know about those numbers. I don't know what you're talking about. So I think we need to learn more about what's in the budget, but more importantly, we need to help one another find ways to explain to the public that government is important. Maybe we have to use different words. Uh, and the last thought I want to share is that maybe we have to change our narrative. Right now, our narrative is business doesn't like all these costs that are built into the state budget. Maybe we have to understand that business does well in states that invest in the things that government needs to do. Business looks to a well-educated workforce, cost to state government for education. Business does well when there's a strong human services sector because those provide, those services are actually part of the fabric, of the economic fabric of every community. People who work in that sector buy goods and services from the business community. Um, I think that list could be expanded and I think all of you would be very uh, successful at doing that. I think it's an important co uh, conversation. The last thing I wanna mention is that in all this discussion over the last 12 months, what happened to the agreement that the people of Illinois articulated that we ought to raise the minimum wage? I'll leave it there. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, Michael, for, one, for your assemblage of of this group of experts and, and right, uh, people who have bought into that we can do better, people who understand the whole thing that we are supposed to have a government that works for us. We're supposed to have a government that is, and as mentioned earlier by one of our speakers, is, is supposed to be where our prioritizing those things that where our heart is, is where our money should be, as, as Bill says. So thank you very much, Bill, for setting the table uh, for how this day is supposed to go. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, I wanted Jerry to go first so I can basically uh, dump everything on him and blame him uh, for the time he was in there. But Jerry, you did a great job um, in one, keeping us focused on, on where we need to go. Uh, this state, um, uh, we do have priorities. 60% of our budget uh, goes to our priorities. It goes to one, two, to Medicaid, you know, our Medicaid is, comprises 23% of our budget. Um, another 17% of our budget goes to paying our, obliga our obligation to pensions. 
And then for K to 12, is another 19%. So 60% of our budget is going towards those things that we hold dear. But as pointed out by several of our speakers, we just don't have enough money to put into those priorities to make sure that they're running well. Uh, and, and I can go on. Human services, which is, is as I hear, is something very important, is, that's 15% of our budget. So we have priorities. So this isn't really lack of knowing where our dollars should be spent. It's do we have enough resources to do it? Talked about education. Uh, Chicago State, I was actually on the radio this morning at 6 o'clock with the, the young students working with them. I met that they have a new president out there. I've met with Northeastern Illinois. Uh, and my responsibilities of chairman on appropriation to all the universities actually come up under my committee. So I've been talking to the Board of Higher Education, our good friend Ed Maloney, uh, who's over there now, um, who's always been a champion for higher education. So we have those priorities. Um, but I don't think the, the population understands that uh, we can only spend the money that we have. Um, our monies mostly come for, for our general revenue. First, first, let me say, for those who think we just have $35 billion budget, uh, that's not the case. We actually have a $74.3 billion budget because we have multiple budgets. But we normally talk about um, our operational budget, and that is the one that we've agreed on uh, has $35 billion uh, that we can spend. But because our governor did not sign the bill, or did not sign a, a, a bill for a spending plan, um, thanks to the courts, and this is, I'm not being sarcastic or anything, truly thanks to the courts, because of the, uh, those consent decrees and those things that were unconstitutional that this governor tried to put forth, um, we are, at this point in time, spending dollars on last year's levels which was almost, which was $37 billion, when we all agreed we weren't going to have $35 billion. So you can see that we have a problem. But 89.4% of those dollars are being spent from last year. Sadly, what does that mean? That means we're spending $33 million more a day <laughs> than we're bringing in. $33 million more a day than what we're bringing in. That's what has to change. We have to change, as, as brought up by several of our speakers, uh, in, in looking at a progressive income tax, looking at how we close those loopholes, Bill, as you pointed out. All of that is on the table, but it's all for naught if, if we do not have a governor who's going to sign the bill. And forget all that. Uh, you have the super, the majority, you can run anything. Uh, the thing is, just because you put on a blue suit that day doesn't mean that you're a Democrat, or if you're wearing a red tie, doesn't necessarily say you're Republican. Because our districts are so multifaceted, and um, I tell providers many times, it's, it's great for you guys who come to the office, uh, to my office, and say what you need, because you can afford to be myopic. You can afford to say, I'm fighting for human services, but what were those other priorities? We want money into our education system. We want to make sure our kids are competitive and make sure that, that they are ready to go out there in this global economy and do stuff. But you want human services. We need more dollars for health care, without question, because without a, a healthy student body, they're not going to learn, no matter what. We, you know, they're not going to read those computers because they need their eyes checked. So we, it's great. But we need to be a great state. We knew, need to do multiple things uh, with our dollars. So let me ask the question. Let me get right back to the question so Robin have a chance. Uh, general revenue funds. The general revenue funds are basically made up of our personal income taxes, uh, tax uh, for corporate income taxes, interfund transfers, and federal sources. Uh, with that, we know that from personal income taxes are 22%. Uh, of our budget, sales taxes are, are, excuse me, personal income taxes are 42%, 22% for sales taxes, and 8% from co corporate taxes. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, uh, we have obligations that we have to pay for out of our, our budget. That 10.6%, I told you 89.4 was there, that 10.6% 
are those basically discretionary dollars that the governor can't hold up. There are no court um, decrees making him or forcing him to spend those dollars. So we have a problem, and unfortunately, in that 10.6% uh, is higher education. It is those programs, those grant programs that goes to the human services. So there is no legal recourse that we can take to make the government fund these things. So, so where do we go from here? Uh, one, the options. Uh, we have been doing what many of you have referred to as fund sweeps. Um, and that was also mentioned earlier that we have hundreds of piggy banks in the state of Illinois and their special funds, hundreds of piggy banks from those fees that we gather uh, from barber fees, lawyer fees, from every time they get a license, if you're a be beautician, uh, we're collecting fees, uh, fees at the, at the parks, uh, parking fees, all of that goes into this budget. And in, that bu in those multiple budgets, in multiple piggy banks, there's over a billion dollars. I believe it's almost $3 billion, or so we'll hear maybe uh, Brian Hamer, who is here, our former revenue director, would, would, would know exactly where those dollars and how many dollars are in there. So we need to see and do like other states and to collapse all of that and put into our general revenue fund, ensure that we do that, like most of the states in the United States do, and, and get more dollars to fund those things that are priority to all of us. Um, we have Robin Gable is going to be next. And how do we make this process more clear? One is to have forms like this. Uh, might have forms like this. So individuals who are not engaged every day in the process, for those individuals who are, are one, making sure that other things, everybody's included. And as our governor was always known to say, everybody in, nobody left out. For those individuals that embrace that concept, that frame of mind, um, we need to just get, get more engaged and make something happen. And one last thing, and this is on the politics side, uh, everybody always talks about uh, registering people vote. And I heard that this morning on the radio. We need to get more people registered to vote. We got the governor that we have right now because the people that were registered didn't come out to vote. We need to have a reclamation of existing voters to come out and get them to vote um, to ensure, not, well, I guess nothing's ensured, but at least have a, a pretty well idea, knowing that we participated fully into the process uh, and, and got a leader that at least recognizes um, our priorities. Thank you. Good morning. It is great to see so many friends and colleagues here today. Um, I don't know what I expected. Of course I would see friends and colleagues here today. So, um, so it's kind of my job, uh, uh, how I view my job is to, I'm going to be very concrete and kind of give you guys uh, some inside baseball about how we create a budget in the House. Now some of you know this because you testify in our committees. How many of you have testified in committees in the House? OK, so about a third. So good. For, so for two thirds of you, this is going to be new information. And I hope uh, it's not too inside that you fa start falling asleep. But um, I, I just first wanted to say that uh, you know, I worked for 20 years as an advocate. So I'm uh, familiar with the budget's impact, both on social services as well as um, uh, as being a vice chair of appropriations and sitting on those committees and having the responsibility to really look through the budgets and figure out how we're going to come up with the budget for the next year. Um, I also want to say that uh, I get, you know, once in a while I get emails from constituents that say things like, um, could you just please pass a balanced budget? Just live within your means. <laughs> live within your means. I represent, um, my district includes, the district that I represent includes Evanston, uh, Kenilworth, East Wilmette, Winnetka, Glencoe, Northbrook, Northfield, and Glenview. So when people tell me that the state should live within their means, 
I get a little upset. So I write them back and I say, okay, listen, so Illinois has the fifth largest economy in the country. Why is it that we are 48th in terms of how much money we spend on people with disabilities? Why are we at the bottom of how we fund education? I said, what does it mean to live within our means? It seems to me that we should be fifth in the nation in all of these areas, and I think that we really need to look at how we raise revenue in the state. So they write me back and say, could you just please live within your means? <laughs> so luckily those are not the people that vote for me. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we, how we uh, come up with a budget in the House. Um, and as you've heard, the first thing that happens is that uh, we kind of pass a, adopt a resolution that says what our revenue number is, what we think our revenue number is going to be for the year. It's usually taken from CACVA. Sometimes it's, it's in discussion with the Senate and the governor's office. Sometimes. OCACVA is a Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability. So they're the organization that comes up with uh, forecasting our, our revenue for the next year. And it is supposed to be nonpartisan. Right, Jerry? It is nonpartisan. It is nonpartisan. OK. You're the chair of it. Oh, OK. <laughs> Co-chair. So it's made up of equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. And then they hire staff to come up with this analysis. So once we have that number, and I'm going to use fiscal year 14, because that was the last year I feel comfortable talking about. Um, that was, uh, and that number they came up with was $34.9 billion. So once we have that number, and it's adopted as a resolution by the House, um, there, what we call is a certain number of what we call mandatory payments are taken off the top. So, and we call that above the line. So of course, everybody wants to be above the line, because that's a mandatory payment. But not everybody can be above the line. So the things that are above the line are things like the pension payment, which in previous uh, iterations of the General Assembly was below the line, meaning that they could pay whatever they wanted and it wasn't a set amount. Now, now it is above the line. That year it was $6 billion. Group health insurance is now above the line, so we have to pay our group health insurance. What was happening was for state employees, their doctors didn't even want to uh, see them anymore because they were not getting paid from the state for their health insurance, although we pay interest. So for my doctor at Northwestern, she said, oh, we're not getting paid. I said, look, this is the best place you can invest your money. You're gonna make 9% a year. Where else can you do that? So uh, the teacher's retirement fund is above the line. Debt service, old bills we put above the line that year. Statutory transfers, about 2.1 billion. And Medicaid was above the line that year. Previously, in last, um, when, when we used to do the budget, before I got there, um, Medicaid was below the line, and every day that you don't pay your Medicaid bills, you save a million dollars. So for many years, they would just put out payment on Medicaid bills and be able to uh, uh, spend money in other arenas. We actually passed a bill one year saying that you had to pay, you had to, figure out how you're going to pay your Medicaid bills in a 12-month cycle. So that became above the line, and that is $6.9 billion out of, I said, a $34.9 billion budget. So then the, the total of that number is then subtracted from the $34.9 billion, and the remainder of it, the remainder, is then divided among our five appropriation committees. So the House has five appropriation committees. The Senate has two. Um, those five appropriation committees each has their own um, chairman, vice chairman, and a minority representative. So how is that money then? And that year, it was $16.1 billion that was divided among the five appropriation committees. How is that money divided among the appropriation committees? It is generally divided based on the percentage that that, that uh, committee had the year before. So it's kind of kept consistent. You get the same percentage of that 16.1 that you had the year before. 
Um, occasionally there are some outstanding expenses that are like one-time payments that they have to coordinate and make sure are paid as well. So for one year they, they hadn't been paying AFSCME workers their raise, and then the court said, well, you have to pay it. So that was a lump sum that we had to figure out how to pay out of the budget. So I'm, I'm gonna just briefly tell you the five ap appropriation committees that there are. Uh, one is human services, which is the one that, um, that I sit on. Um, it accounts for 32% uh, of the budget. In human services, it includes uh, Department of Human Services, Public Health, DCFS, Department on Aging, Healthcare and Family Services, the part that's not Medicaid, Veterans Affairs, Guardianship and Advocacy Commission, Department of Human Rights, Human Rights Commission, and the Illinois Council on Developmental Disabilities, and the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Commission. So the process then is that each one of those uh, departments comes and testifies to the committee. And um, there are some public meetings where that happens, and then there are some private meetings behind closed doors. So when I first got there, and they tell me we're going into, we're going into committee, and then we're adjourning, and then we're going into private session, I said, what are you talking about? There's the Open Meetings Act. And they said, oh yeah, it doesn't apply to the legislature. So we go into private meetings, which just has the members of the committee, any other legislator that wants to attend, and then invited guests. Sometimes the invited guests are some advocates. How many advocates here have come to the private meetings? There are a few. Um, and, then, uh, and then the department heads and their chief financial officer come. And we actually put up on the screen and go through line item by line item of their budget. And we compare it to the governor's proposed budget, we compare it to last year's budget, the year before's budget, and we talk to, and they have to, they come and they kind of justify the governor's budget, and then, um, and then we ask them questions and go through line by line on uh, what their spending plan is and why. And I have to tell you, most of the time, we feel like we wish we could give more money rather than have to reduce lines in the budget. It is, um, I mean, every time you talk to people and you go through this, you are saying there, there needs to be more money. Um, but we are given a 32% a of 16.1 billion and we have to come up with a plan. So we do the best we can. Uh, the other, um, hearings that are in other committees, and I, I assume they do it the same way. I only sit in one appropriation committee, but I think they're done relatively the same way. The other committees are um, higher education, which includes state universities, Illinois Board of Higher Ed, uh, Illinois Community College Board, Math and Science Academy, for, as some of the examples. Then there's K through 12 education is the third committee and that is all the funding for the schools through the Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, fourth is general services, which includes, and that's 6% of the budget. K through 12 is 40% of, of what's remaining of our below the line. Higher education is 12% of what's below the line. Um, and general services includes all executive branch offices, um, boards and commissions, a total of 47 departments, Public safety is the fifth and the last one, and that includes about 10% of the budget. State police, Department of Corrections, Department of Transportation, Department of Labor, Department of Juvenile Justice, Capital Development Board, and 15 others. So in a nutshell, that's the process. Um, there gives some flex a lot of flexibility to individual legislators as we go through each line item to talk about why they think individual lines or items are important, why some should have more, why some should have less. Um, so it really is, in a way, a pretty democratic process because um, we are elected by the people. So um, thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to the discussion period. All right, well, very, very well uh, said for uh, all of you. For the, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jerry, uh, 
Robin and Donnie. Let's so, just stay for one more. There, there, we're going to get time for one question here, which I think raises an issue that we haven't talked about, but is clearly very important. Uh, the question is, how can we as policy stakeholders stop uh, the DHS proposed appeals rules that deny people's basic human rights when they need to continue or increase services? Um, and I don't know if we have specific answers to that. If you do, great. But uh, I think it, it's just uh, helpful to mention for a minute that this that there are the, there's this rules process, and that uh, through the rules, uh, a lot of decisions get made about how to implement the laws that were passed and that have budgetary implications. So I think uh, if anybody wants to take that on quickly, uh, uh, it would be helpful. Well, I think that's a, a very fundamental and timely question. Um, there, uh, my sense is that the, and Amber laid this out early this morning, uh, the administration is struggling to um, tighten up here, there, and everywhere, and tightening up on, on the most vulnerable people in our society uh, is appalling and reprehensible, but nobody knows it's happening. Earlier this last year, uh, a similar thing was happened, uh, Im imposed on the assistance to low-income families for child care payments. Low-income working families in our state get some help with child care, uh, according to a set of rules and procedures, and the administration imposed a tightening of those rules and procedures, leaving lots of, of low-income parents uh, without child care assistance. So, the community raised a ruckus. It took a, a, a longer than many of us had hoped, but eventually the administration backed down. And so I think, you know, learning from the suggestions of our um, folks from the media, um, we're going to have to raise a ruckus about this. And I would encourage, and I think Michael said we need to form a, a broader coalition, so those of us who might not be part of the disability community need to help that community raise this ruckus uh, and make the public understand that tightening those rules harms everybody, including the particular people with disabilities. Anything to add? All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, another uh, <laughs> scintillating conversation here.